Are you ready? Ready. Stage is yours then. Thank you <laughs> so you. much. Come on, give me a round of applause. Come on. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. I know we're nearing the end of the conference, so I hope you've all uh, had your dose of coffee. Um, I know this is going to be a, sort of a rough afternoon, but we'll, uh, we'll try and make this snappy and hopefully interactive. I'm uh, Ashwin Naveen. Um, really excited to be here in Poland the first time. Uh, it's been a really, really awesome experience so far. If at any point you want to talk about anything I'm um, going to present, just yell at me. Uh, just stand up and ask a question. I'm gonna, I know a few of you, so I might pick on you, you know, throughout the presentation. I'm expecting you to pick on me as well. Um, the title of the talk is, uh, is, it is always on all the time. And I'm uh, interested to present a concept that um, is, I'm calling ambient computing. Uh, I know that you know, this is probably a, a term that's been used in the broad sphere of Internet of Things, and I know there's some really hot and interesting activity in this category here in Poland. Um, do we have any estimate folks in the, in the audience? I know there's some folks that are friends with them. But anyway, as I'm going along, um, I might refer to that, to that uh, company since it's one that we're all familiar with here in, the, in Poland. Um, to shape my perspective, uh, I just want to sort of give you a little bit of intro to myself. Uh, I got my first computer when I was uh, about six years old. It was 1983. Um, it was a big deal for my family. It wasn't cheap. Um, but I have a younger brother, and uh, he wanted one as well. Uh, there was a lot of uh, angst in our family, and so my parents were very kind and generous to actually buy a second computer in a couple years later. Um, Dad really wanted one for his, uh, for his business. Uh, so for before long, we had three computers by the late 80s. Uh, and then it turns out that as I was getting ready to, uh, to go to high school and wanted one at school at, for you know, something to go, uh, take with me, we ended up getting a laptop. And then you know, mom wanted one. And then you know, the first smartphone came out. And I think this probably mimics uh, the experiences that you guys have all had in the adoption of computing in your households. Just curious, um, how many of you got your first computer in the 80s in the audience? It's, uh, it's about maybe less than 10% of you. How, how about in the 90s? Hopefully that's the rest of you. I'm going to feel really old. OK, so, um, so you've probably had similar experiences. You know, you, today I can say that in our household, um, you know, it, we were probably in the single digit number of computers in our household in the 80s. Maybe uh, we got into the double digits in the 90s. Today, you know, I would say we're probably approaching hundreds uh, into the, you know, sort of that level. Uh, we're seeing computing outside of personal computers and phones, tablets, TVs, and God knows what other else. Uh, we recently got the, the Nest thermostat installed at our house. Um, we're probably going to go with the smoke alarm product too. We're totally geeked out. Um, and, and that's probably true of a lot of households uh, that are you know, probably represented here at the conference. A lot of you have probably seen this trajectory. Um, you know, for the, the course of uh, you know, maybe the last 150 years, we've known that people have been trying to connect places through uh, physical connectivity, you know, planes, trains, automobiles. Um, we, as people in the, with a strong desire to be social and communicate with each other, um, thanks to phones and computers, have been using computers to stay in touch with each other. Uh, and, and connectivity has sort of surpassed the physical connectivity of places uh, some years ago. But in the not-too-distant future, things, objects, uh, will be communicating with each other as well. And we expect that, uh, that inflection point to be in the, in the very you know, sort of di uh, near future where devices are all sort of wired up and communicating with each other. So we, a lot of you have known that this is category, this phenomenon has been called the Internet of Things. Uh, I'd like to articulate a sort of segment of that market, um, which I'm calling ambient computing. Uh, it's not the entire Internet of Things market. It's a segment of it. It's a, it's a subset of the devices that we have in our uh, digital lifestyles. Um, Ashwin Naveen, born and raised in California, Apple fanboy since 1983, um, started my first company in 2001, uh, which was acquired by a, a big scary bank called Goldman Sachs, uh, and then went to Yahoo where I was uh, very sort of um, fortunate to work in a, in a digital media capacity in the business development digital media. Uh, got to meet the, the uh, inventor of BitTorrent, uh, co-founded that company with the inventor, and then um, I'm now onto my third startup, a company called Samba TV. 
Um, happy to talk about any of these logos. Um, these are all you know, near and dear to my heart. Um, any, any questions about BitTorrent, any questions about my first startup? I'll just introduce um, the things that we were doing in each of these three startups, because those are the things that I care about the most. The first startup was a company called Epic Partners. Um, the company was founded in 2000. Uh, I was uh, 22 years old, a group of six people that started the company. Um, it was a financial services company. It was in, built at the time when a lot of people were investing for the first time through the web. How many of you have ever bought a stock through a web browser you know, without calling a broker? And so, so it's a fair number. By 2000, when we started the company, there was actually more than a, almost $2 trillion that were in individual uh, consumer accounts on these sort of web-based brokerages. That uh, was larger than any one single mutual fund, which was how most people were investing prior to that. Um, the problem is that, what we, and the problem that we tried to solve with Epic is that while we all wanted to be able to trade ourselves, inform ourselves, and, and uh, buy things on our own, Epic was um, able to provide access to IPOs to that group of people. IPOs at the time were basically held off and given to the big mutual funds because they were you know, in that sort of old boys network. With Epic, we were able to allocate um, IPOs to uh, individual investors who were keen to buy them. So uh, a really you know, interesting and potentially disruptive play to disrupt companies like Goldman Sachs. Unfortunately, uh, as you dot com historians may recognize, 2000 was about the worst time to start a financial services company, especially serving tech IPOs because that was the end of the tech IPO bubble. Um, Goldman Sachs bought the company to shut it down, basically. So uh, a really interesting uh, close, uh, uh, chapter close there. Um, stayed at, at Goldman for about a year, uh, and then went to Yahoo and got to work at, in Yahoo for a couple years. Yahoo at the time was sort of coming out of the dot-com bust. The company was run by a movie studio chief who would left Warner Brothers to run uh, Yahoo, moved from LA to the Silicon Valley. Uh, brought some of that Hollywood DNA with him, and I got to work with these guys and uh, sort of uh, bring Yahoo out of the dot-com bust. Uh, cool experiences, got to work on uh, a lot of media and digital media products, uh, looked at some acquisitions, things like Netflix and uh, Fandango and a number of other services related to movies and, and entertainment. Um, got introduced to the inventor of BitTorrent. BitTorrent was fairly well-known at that point within niches. Um, much more well known at the time were, you know, basically the companies that had been shut down in the file sharing space, Napster, ones that were in litigation, companies like Grokster, um, and BitTorrent was potentially going to be the next one in the crosshairs. Uh, I told the, the Hollywood folks at Yahoo that I was leaving to co-found this company with the inventor and they all thought I was nuts. Um, but it was, a, a, you know, an interesting time for uh, digital media. At the time when we started BitTorrent, the cost of downloading a movie um, just in terms of bandwidth cost to a, a provider of that movie was somewhere around $7. So if you wanted to make a movie available for a price, you were probably going to spend the entire amount in infrastructure, no chance of ever making that profitable. We thought BitTorrent would be an interesting way to make digital distribution an actually uh, viable business. Uh, and so spent four years trying to get that, uh, that dream to market. Uh, and then I'll sort of introduce Samba TV. Um, and why I think that's an interesting successor to what I've done in the past. Any questions about any of these companies or things that I've done in the past? How many BitTorrent users do we have? What was the last thing you downloaded? Yeah. That you're, those who are not raising their hands are actually lying, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good one. So, I mean, if you weren't going to download it, how would you have accessed it the legitimate way? Is that possible here? Yeah, but then I would have it two, years, two, two days later. And by the time you open your Twitter client, you would have had a spoiler, and one day later, spoilers probably would have destroyed that experience. Um, what we found was that, you know, BitTorrent gets a bad rap, you know, uh, within the Hollywood sphere, but those were the exact pieces of feedback we were getting. There were folks in Australia who were downloading episodes of Lost. This was back when Lost was on air. Because the, the delivery, the traditional delivery mechanisms took 30 days to get it to market in Australia after the original broadcast um, in, in the US. Uh, we'd get letters from um, 
you know, troops in, in Iraq who were deployed in the US military uh, who had no access to any of this stuff uh, and were basically using BitTorrent on the base in Iraq to download um, movies and TV shows. Um, BitTorrent's origination, though, was in a, in a much smaller niche. It was uh, a, a bunch of folks who wanted to download Grateful Dead concerts, uh, download Fish concerts with no, um, w in lossless, uh, in compressed format with, with lossless compression. Massive files. There was no way that they could have uh, been able to deliver those things with a business model. And the bands didn't want there to be a business model for those things anyway. So um, some really cool and interesting experiences with BitTorrent. Coming back to this whole Internet of Things phenomenon, you know, in a, in a, a, a fairly modern household, we know that everything is all sort of connected. Um, given the things that I've worked on in my life, the device that I was um, most interested in was the television. Um, things that folks in the Internet of Things arena would be happy to share with you is that common characteristics and what's enabled this phenomenon to happen is that we've moved beyond the x86 Intel-based hardware architecture. We're now in sort of embedded platforms where Moore's Law is still in play, but the cost of computing is, is and embedded computing is dramatically cheaper, uh, and we can start to enable devices kind of in the fabric of our lifestyles uh, at no perceived, uh, or very minimal perceived cost to the consumer. These devices are always on, they're always connected. Um, you know, Wi-Fi is abundant, we've got fantastic LTE coverage here in Poland and everywhere else in the world. Um, something that the uh, Internet of Things folks also point out is important for a device to, to be part of that grid is that they have to be contextually aware. They have to be aware of the, envir the environment and be able to enhance or improve the environment uh, based on that sensory awareness. Uh, and then the business models and the services, it's no, no longer good enough to sell a thermostat that someone could uh, hook into their house there has to be this sort of continuity uh, in the service and the product. Uh, when you hook up a Nest, um, you know, the relationship with the consumer is 24 hours a day. Uh, they're expecting the data and the insights on their household, their energy efficiency, all the time. Uh, so it's no longer a business model where you sell a piece of hardware and you forget about it. Maybe you're even trying to convince people to buy a new piece of hardware and hoping that the, the last one breaks. In fact, your relationship with the consumer is persistent. So these were all things that uh, you know, people say are uh, very common about the Internet of Things. The other thing that's interesting in the connected device market is that every device has an identity. Uh, whether we assign one explicitly or not, uh, whoever is manufacturing that device uh, knows exactly which device is out there uh, and how to reach it. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> you know, so for those of us who grew up in the 80s, um, the idea that these devices are sort of uh, much more aware of us, our needs, and, and personalized, um, you know, is kind of like a, a dream come true. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of entrepreneurs are pursuing this dream. Um, I imagine that estimates somewhere on this grid. I just grabbed this graph off of, uh, or this graphic off of TechCrunch, but this is a, a landscape of the Internet of Things. You've got uh, companies that are basically building horizontal platforms. You've got companies that are building vertical applications. Um, you've got uh, you know, a variety of building blocks. Um, I was really interested in the TV. The reason is um, pretty obvious. I've been working in digital media um, for most of my career. Um, other reasons, it's super enticing. It's super magical. I mean, uh, how many Game of Thrones fans are there out there? How many of you have watched Silicon Valley, the, the show on HBO? I mean, like, there's so many things that are uh, capturing social media and uh, our, even our physical conversations. Um, these are all really fun and interesting programs to talk about. Television today in the U.S., and this, is, this number is fairly consistent across the world, um, it's, it commands about five and a half hours of our day. Um, can you guys hear me okay? So five and a half hours of the average American household is spent in front of a television. It's insane. Um, the interesting thing from a connectivity perspective is that 80% of the time, people when they watch TV are doing something else. They've got some other device open and there's uh, connectivity in that device. Um, the TV itself may not be connected, but that, that is quickly changing. Um, other interesting things, from a dollar perspective, the thing that's I think very seductive about the television is that um, if you add up all of Facebook's revenue, if you add up all of Google's revenue, if you add up all of Yahoo's revenue, you still don't even get half of the amount of money that's spent on TV advertising. 
which is an insane, it's just sort of mind-blowing that the numbers are that big. The other thing that's interesting, that doesn't include subscriptions. So Netflix subscriptions, HBO subscriptions, all of that kind of stuff, also doesn't even come anywhere close to the amount of money that we spend on cable and satellite and paid television access. From a reach perspective, here's another mind-blowing stat. This is unfortunately very US-centric, but probably more ag exacerbated in Poland. Um, in the US today, 2014, 280 million people watch TV. Uh, about 220 million use the web. Uh, and then the amount that they use the web is 80% uh, less than the amount that they watch TV. And then, of course, if you're a brand marketer or an advertiser, you're going to spend a lot more on television as a result of all these uh, sort of macro-level stats. I believe today is the golden age of television. Um, and if you were, we're thinking about this world of connected devices, we would be crazy not to be thinking about, you know, how does the TV fit into this world of Internet of Things? Uh, and so that's going to be sort of the, uh, the topic for the next uh, 20 or so minutes. Um, Something that we all know and something that's near and dear to all of my sort of friends who've used BitTorrent, um, we are in control of the entertainment experience to the extent that we've never had control in the past. Uh, even in, this, in, the, in the traditional TV landscape, the amount of devices that have the ability to record shows, strip commercials, place shift the programming to you know, when you're at work and you want to see what's on uh, recorded on your device at home, uh, the amount of control that we have over this entertainment is, is pretty astounding. Uh, that's scary as shit for the traditional broadcaster who's basically been able to bank on the fact that you've always had to consume television the same way. So for the last 70 years, we've lived in this sort of top-down model where the broadcaster can say, okay, at 8 p.m. tonight or 7 p.m. tomorrow when Game of Thrones is on, uh, that's when you're going to be able to watch the show. They've built their business models on this phenomenon. Um, What's interesting is that the tech guys, all the tech guys in the room, love these top-down models, because that's just sort of a recipe for disruption, right? We love looking at those things and saying, OK, well, this is a market that hasn't been disrupted. Let's take a page right out of the internet playbook and throw it right into the television. So what we know about the internet is that pre-2000, the first generation of web products were very much like broadcast TV. Like, take first generation of web products, like Yahoo, a home page manually programmed and uh, you know, um, editorialized. Uh, you go to yahoo.com and you would see exactly what someone typed into the Yahoo homepage. Um, 2005 comes along and we start to see that you know, the, the pages are starting to get dynamic. Amazon makes a public statement that says when you load amazon.com, instead of three or four dynamic elements on the homepage of, Amazon, or of Yahoo, there's 250 or 300 dynamic elements or database calls to generate the Amazon homepage. Um, so now starting, the web is starting to feel a little bit more relevant and personal. Uh, and then we come to the current era where you load Facebook, uh, Facebook's homepage, and absolutely nothing is, de very few things are determined by any central entity. It's almost entirely provided by uh, a, a social network and uh, you know, folks that you care about. So we, look, we have this backdrop to work with uh, from the web. Um, and so we expect that you know, perhaps TV will follow this, uh, this similar trend. You know, Yahoo was disrupted by Google and Facebook, Facebook disrupted Google. Um, when you talk about sort of the travel industry, we used to call a travel agent to book a travel uh, reservation. Then we were able to do that online and then now Airbnb is providing the supply in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Comcast or any cable or satellite company was the way that you would get your television. Uh, then we had Netflix. Uh, and now the, the programming that we consume on the web was not even created by a professional entity. It could be uh, maybe um, provided by a consumer, him or herself. Uh, and then delivery as well. We've seen the same phenomenon, you know, where centralized delivery gives way to peer-to-peer -peer phenomenons. So what the tech industry did is they said that the way that we're going to disrupt the television market is we're going to build a, a smart TV. We're going to build a TV and we're going to put apps on it because that's what disrupted the phone market and uh, you know this looks a lot like an Apple TV or Google TV everyone's got all the major tech companies have some variation of this phenomenon where you get a bunch we've given we've said all right goodbye TV schedule uh, and electronic programming guide we're gonna take uh, a portfolio of apps into the television um, that sucks how many of you have a smart TV 
just curious, out of, out of those that do, how many of you have connected it to the, uh, to the internet or to the Wi-Fi? So it seems like most of you connected it, and how, how much of it do you, how much of the internet features uh, do you use relative to the traditional? Anyone want to sort of characterize? Like if you had to guess, like 5%, 10%, 20%, 5%, 10 100% OTT, over the top. What are you doing? A DIY home theater PC guy, <laughs> near and dear to my heart. How many of you want a, a home theater PC? <laughs> it's like always like 3% of the population. Um, and, and they're the ones that blaze the trail. But what we have uh, you know, to do is figure out how we learn from you and implement those in mainstream products. What the tech industry came up with, and in response to the home theater PC guys, is the smart TV. And, and uh, what we've managed to do is uh, really disappoint. Um, Google TV was a, a very, very public um, presentation of this phenomenon. Um, to give you some perspective on this, uh, Google TV went to the TV manufacturers like Sony, convinced them to make a Google TV, convinced them to spend three times as much on components to make the Google TV that they would normally spend on a television. Then they convinced Best Buy, which is the largest electronic retailer in the, uh, in the US, to buy $500 million worth of them. And about $400 million of, dollars of those still sit on the store shelves and in the warehouses today. Um, it, was a, it was a failure, mostly because we were thinking about the television like a computer. And so one of the things that we learned was that by throwing a Wi-Fi uh, antenna into a television and a web browser, we did not make that TV smart. And we didn't solve the, uh, you know, the needs that people have to, to gain more control over the entertainment. What we've also learned is that um, even the folks that do have these smart TVs and that have all the apps that they may want, uh, that the app, the killer app within this sort of portfolio of apps is traditional linear television. We heard that you know, 90% of this gentleman's time with his television is still traditional TV. Uh, I'd say that's probably higher than the average for smart TV owners. Uh, sorry, that's uh, lower than the average. So most people are, are spending less than 10% on their OTT or over-the-top services. They're still spending 90% plus with traditional linear television. So this revolution, this revolution that we all want to start, uh, you know, is, is basically a crowd of like 5% of the population. Uh, we haven't been able to get this to lift off. So, all right, let's take a deeper look at traditional TV. Why is it that um, we haven't been able to get that revolution to start? Well, part of it is Behavior patterns. You know, the behavior patterns of television are now 70 years old, uh, and challenging behavior patterns are not so easy. We've learned this across a variety of products and categories on the web. Um, the industry is also not really eager to support this disruption, uh, as in that's pretty obvious, but just to give you some perspective on that, um, here's what a traditional TV value chain looks like. Uh, if we can take a popular show like CSI, produced by Jerry Bruckheimer. Uh, Bruckheimer makes a deal with his studio, Warner Brothers, and his broadcaster, CBS, in the US to get this into distribution, which would be uh, retailers like Walmart for the box sets. It'd be Lowe's for you know, maybe a thea theatrical version of the show. Um, it's Comcast to get it on, uh, on the channel guide. Uh, and then ultimately, you would get this in a device. The device itself is almost invisible in this value chain. Um, to give you some, th uh, some color on how this business works, as I've learned, if you're Sony today, um, you're actually selling every TV at a loss. I don't know if anyone knows this, but if you look at Sony's public numbers, every TV sold is sold at a loss. Samsung, in its most recent quarter, recently reported it's losing money on every TV it sells as well. Incredible. Uh, compared to that to the cell phone market, where there is kind of this more interesting business model for the manufacturer, a lot of these companies are all wondering why they're making TVs anymore. Compare that to the distributor, the folks that actually... Um, uh, sell you the subscriptions, they're selling about, in the US, about a, almost 100 million subscriptions on an average of $60 a month. That's $60 billion. They get a 30% operating margin. That means they're putting money in the bank every month that you're paying that subscription fee. Also at a 30% uh, margin is the, uh, the advertising industry. The broadcasters are selling advertising to the ad agencies, are making a very high margin and even more money than the cable companies. So this is not a market that those guys are very eager to throw away. They're actually very eager to protect it. Um, so what did we get right and wrong? So you've got this traditional um, broadcast arena. 
uh, and you've got basically the first generation of smart TV products, which weren't really much different than the top down business models uh, that the broadcasters had in place. In fact, you know, when you load an app on a Google TV, it's basically an app developer loading what was the Yahoo homepage, a bunch of editorialized videos available to you to stream. Uh, and what we didn't do in the smart TV category is we didn't learn from the Internet of Things guys. The, the things that go into making a Nest or any of the Estimote platform users successful is not only connect connectivity, uh, it's, it's context. Uh, the television today, the smart TV today, completely ignores what you want to do with your television. It completely ignores the fact that 95% of your time you're not using the smart TV functions. So I'd like to argue that um, in the broad landscape of computing, if we've got the PCs, phones, and tablets, which are very dramatic in the way that they engage you, you're very focused and very captive to those devices when you're using them. Then you've got the nests of the world that are sort of embedded in the fabric of our, of our homes and our lifestyle. There's another category within the Internet of Things arena that I'm calling ambient computing, which sits sort of adjacent to our offline behavior and enhances that. Uh, TV, like it or not, is probably not ripe for a revolution. And that's sort of frustrating and sad coming from the bit, one of the BitTorrent guys. Uh, we all went into the TV market thinking that television is like telephone service, that we could just build an internet alternative to the cable company and deploy it and disrupt and destroy uh, that model in favor of something that was much better, cheaper, and uh, a better experience for the consumer. But in fact, what we're finding is that um, in, in, in this arena, what we probably need are services like Yelp, which sit adjacent to McDonald's. They don't replace McDonald's. Um, they, I, what's the Yelp equivalent in Poland? Do, do folks use Yelp here in, in Poland? So anyone know what the Yelp? Okay, so if you're looking for a great Italian restaurant, that's the app you would use. Um, what's interesting about that is that it sits adjacent to these offline businesses. It helps you navigate those offline businesses. It enhances the experience for those offline businesses, but it doesn't overthrow them. And so that's that's sort of the realization that we're getting to uh, in the in the TV arena. Broadly, we think that ambient computing sits adjacent to these offline businesses and enhances these offline businesses. Um, so how are we going to do this? Um, the television itself has game consoles hooked up to it, like we saw out here in the lobby. It has cable boxes. It has a tuner to get signals over the air. Um, and it has smart TV apps. It has apps like Netflix and uh, YouTube built into it. So it has a variety of things that are jamming into the television from a variety of different sources. The TV itself is only really aware of a very small number of those things. In fact, uh, when you use the smart TV apps, most of the time the smart TV knows what you're consuming, but most of the rest of the time it's, it has no contextual understanding of what's happening in that living room. So uh, we believe for the smart TV to really participate in this Internet of Things revolution, it needs to be contextually aware of everything that hits that screen. Uh, and so, um, this is a long-winded introduction to the things that I'm working on. We're basically trying to build some technology that sits in the screen to understand the things that you care about uh, in order to not only enhance those things, but also recommend things that uh, are similar to those. Uh, so here's an example. Um, while the World Cup's on, or the NBA Finals, or any, any game for that matter, a lot of folks would love to know stats, would love to know what's going on you know, much deeper than you would want to clutter a TV interface for. So once that TV is contextually aware of what you care about, it can enhance and inform all these other screens around the, the television, uh, what's on screen and what, what might be of interest to you. Um, things that you might be interested to purchase. Um, at the bottom, at the end of the day, TV can be far more quantifiable if it's contextually aware. Uh, and then we can take all the guesswork, you know, basically where, where Amazon was able to sort of take its homepage to the next level, we can actually take TV to the next level and make it much more representative of the things that you care about if it's aware of your, of your needs and interests. Um, so basically coming back to the sort of traditional value, value chain of television, over time, we think that in order for this marketplace to get distributed, Silicon Valley companies, 
Polish tech companies, uh, disruptors the world over, need to be thinking about how do we evolve television rather than overthrow it. Um, there's been a lot of evidence that's been su uh, of success in the TV market when we think in those terms. There's a company called Sling. I don't know if you guys have, if it's reached the Polish market. How many of you have heard of Sling? So Sling, not very many, I'll explain it. Sling is a, is a piece of hardware that you can buy. Uh, it sits on top of your television, and it literally just allows you to watch whatever's on that, your television from anywhere in the world. So you could be uh, um, basically at work, you open a web browser, you log into your Sling box at home, and you can see what's on screen. You can also change the channel. It didn't um, overthrow your cable subscription. It just extended whatever you have on your television out to the rest of the web. Uh, and so, you know, the cable companies actually not only, they sort of didn't view that as a threat. They, in fact, actually one of them actually came out and bought the company. Um, the second largest satellite company in the world went out and bought Sling and made that part of its core, core portfolio. Um, DVRs, how many of you have DVRs? You know, DVRs in your house. Very few, not so many. TiVo boxes, uh, cable provided DVRs. So another example of how to play in the television market to, make, to be innovative in the TV market without overthrowing cable is to give people the ability to record their favorite shows, whether it comes from cable or satellite or uh, over the air. It's basically taking anything that you care about into your own personal hardware and making it yours on your schedule rather than when the broadcaster is scheduling it. Now, when you compare that to Google TV, who's basically saying broadcast TV is just one of thousands of apps on your television, um, what we found is that just isn't working. You know, people aren't interested in having that uh, capability. Enhancing the way that they currently view television, the currently consume television, has had a far better track record. Uh, anyone disagree with me? I'd love to, you know, uh, hear alternative views on this. How about my home theater PC guys? Any thoughts? I'm nearing the end of my talk here, so I, I've been uh, going for about 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes. Anything of interest? So that was the stated uh, slideware. Uh, as, in, as sort of a guy who's done a few startups, happy to talk about startups in Silicon Valley, happy to talk about digital media, happy to talk about fundraising, current climate, tips and tricks, all that kind of stuff. Mistakes made. Bueller. <laughs> For what? Well, once the TV actually understands uh, Sorry, what you do. care about. So what kind of use cases do you see for the Samba TV technology? Yeah, it's a uh, good question. So the technology uh, is, a, it is a platform. So it sits within television to understand what's on screen. Um, what we've heard people want to do with this are recommendations. You know, they would really love to get uh, to solve the discovery problem. You know, in the U.S., where there's 500 channels in your channel guide, um, navigating and scrolling through that is painful, especially when one goes into commercial break. To be able to switch over to something else takes a lot of effort. Um, just being contextually aware and helping people discover things that they might care about quickly is interesting. Um, other sort of more simplistic things that we like to enable and are quick wins. We've all had that problem when you're watching a movie or a TV show and you can't remember the name of the actor. And so, um, you know, being able to provide that level of metadata at your fingertips. So, aha, that's the name of the actor or the actress. These are the other, um, you know, movies and TV shows that they've been in. Uh, here are the photos that they're posting to Instagram. Uh, here's the you know, their latest sex tape or gossip that might be, you know, sort of trending on the headlines. Those are all things that people would love to have at their fingertips, uh, but are not so easy to, to access in a world where television is offline. What do you think? That's promising. <laughs> Any other? Um, hi, so I don't have a smart TV. I do have a TV with a USB input in it, and basically, and it's not connected to anything else. And what I do is get on my computer, get on BitTorrent, get the latest Game of Thrones, put it on a portable hard drive, put the hard drive in the TV. 
And wouldn't streamlining that process, taking the computer out of it, wouldn't that be a way like forward? Uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So I went to um, one of the, when I was, it was probably 2006, uh, I went out to Korea and uh, I sat with um, folks at LG and Samsung and then went to Japan and met with folks at Sony and uh, Panasonic and I basically said, hey guys, can we build a BitTorrent client directly into one of your TVs? And uh, we got guys who were like super fired up on that. Yeah, and they were like, yeah, it's the best fucking idea ever. And then it, it, it never went beyond that. Because it, you know, as soon as it got to the legal department of any of these companies, uh, it was like, are you, are you freaking nuts? We would never do it. We like, look at, look at how big our balance sheet is. You know, that's, we'd get sued instantly. Um, that would be a really killer thing. There are examples of this happening in China. There are smart TV manufacturers in China, brands that you probably haven't heard of. Uh, they, they're very local. Uh, that are building peer-to-peer -peer technology into the displays. Uh, and it's super fascinating because the Chinese media industry is very obviously government controlled. Uh, and everything that you see and you're exposed to is, is sanctioned by the government typically. In fact, the TV penetration in China is higher than the telephone penetration because the government cares more about its ability to communicate with you than the ability for you to communicate with each other. But, you know, lo and behold, the display companies are actually building that capability into television so that you know, the file sharing networks that exist on your PC would ultimately be able to hit your, your TV display. Um, I think it's gonna take you know, sort of pockets of success for that phenomenon to emerge. Uh, there was a company that preceded BitTorrent by a, a few years called Divix. And uh, Divix was typically the encode that you would see on the torrent site uh, that you would be able to burn to like a, a, you know, a 700 megabyte uh, optical medium and then walk over or stick in your CD collection or something like that. And what Divix did is that they um, went around and made the same pitch that I made. Uh, and they were falling over just like we were, except they found one little company, I think it was a Danish company, uh, that made a, um, a DVD player that had the Divix support in it. And when that, when that DVD player hit the market somewhere here in Europe, it sold like crazy. Uh, and Divix was able to take that success and uh, market the numbers to other manufacturers. And now, even the PlayStation ships with DIVX support. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's possible. It's probably a lot of effort. Supporting a codec is probably a little bit more hands-off than actually having the uh, downloader and playback built into the display. It's probably a little bit too close for their comfort. But uh, it's certainly the dream scenario. Um, I just think that the, the industry has so much to lose from that that it might make it uh, difficult for commercial entities to be around after they ship it, after they ship the product. Any other? Um, just the company you were talking about, it's Kiss Technology, the Danish one. The Danish one? Yeah, it, it was called Kiss Technology. You got it, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but actually, I've got a question. Um, do you think that we really need investments in a smart TV uh, 2.0. Because like, even nowadays when you look at how can we use smartphones, like when you have Samsung phone, you can already wirelessly stream everything into your TV. So actually you don't really need a television, you just need a screen. And at some point when we will have uh, not like 5 GB uh, limits in your phone, like 100. You can already stream everything from your phone into your TV. So to some po at some point, like all these apps at, uh, at the TV will be pointless because uh, like now, uh, and then we're thinking about like smart uh, home. So we want to have everything connected. So everything will be like done from your phone. So you won't really need any apps, etc. cetera. Well, the, the experience you just articulated does require the TV to be connected. Correct? To your phone. Well, it, it's connected. It's on your network. Yeah. OK, so I totally agree with you that the experience of discovery should be outside of the television interface, because the volume of content that we have available to us is far greater. I'm actually would be thrilled to meet a designer who can actually solve that problem. But my gut is that you can't design a TV interface that adequately presents the volume of content that we have available to us. On the other hand, the interfaces that we have in our, in our hands uh, already today, for example, your smartphone, is probably a far easier discovery point 
Uh, and then what you want the TV to do is play it back. Um, this is a realization that Google has made in you know, what they're calling Chromecast, which is basically the successor to Google TV. You're discovering outside of the television and using the TV as a playback device. Uh, I think that's, that makes a ton of sense. But you're not going to be able to avoid connectivity in the television. Uh, and then the interesting thing about the television itself is that uh, without contextual awareness, um, you, know, you still have a discovery problem, though, because the things that you care about the most, you ultimately want to want to consume on your television. And that, the, some of that stuff might be things that come off of an Xbox or a PlayStation. So the TV will be connected and has an opportunity to inform a lot of other services and a lot of other apps the things that you care about and be able to improve the experiences for those things. So then, but you said that it cannot, uh, television cannot be avoided. So then what do you think about uh, Samsung Beam concept? I, I mean, it's all in the same vein. I mean, the things that are working right now are AirPlay, Chromecast, whether you call it beaming or flinging or whatever. No, but like that you have a projector built in within your phone. So you won't uh, even ah. need the actual TV because uh, already Samsung created this phone and it's got a pretty good resolution as well. You have like 30 inch screen on your wall. I'm very skeptical of an idea. This is, I mean, this is a, a very valid argument, but I'm very skeptical of an idea that takes your personal devices hostage, especially when you're trying to have a shared experience. You know, like I, I Sometimes we'll hook a, a PC up to a, a projector like this one. And then you know, I might get a notification or some kind of messages that clutters that screen. Um, you know, that's embarrassing sometimes, because I don't know what's going to be in that message. Uh, worse than that, I would hate for my personal device to be held hostage by that shared experience, because I, there may be things I want to do with that device. There's absolutely no reason why you can't offload some of the compute to the display itself, you know, whether it be uh, just directing the display to fetch a stream and then the decoding is happening in the display. Totally normal and there's abundant computing in the TVs today to be able to do things like that. But it's, a, I mean, smart people can disagree on this. I mean, it's just an architectural thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm Bart. I want to ask you, I wanted to ask you what is your business model with your with your product or with your technology? You want to work with TV producers or or distributors because, as I understand, you do not want to build another application that would basically launch TV. Um, so, uh, could you repeat the question? So you're saying I, I want to. I just want to know what is your business model with with your product? If you want to uh. cooperate with. Uh, um, TV producers or distributors, like, I don't know, TV platforms? So we're a software company that, um, you know, what we decided to do is solve uh, the problem that the TV isn't contextually aware of what people care about. And the thing that we hear a lot from the broadcasting industry is that uh, they're very um, frustrated with the data that they get uh, on viewership. In the US today, um, the $72 billion that I uh, presented earlier in terms of advertising spend is all informed and dictated by uh, a sample called the Nielsen sample. Here in um, Poland, what did we hear it was called? It's the same. Okay, so you've got the Nielsen sample. Maybe but, Nielsen. Uh, Kantar and some other companies are here in, in Poland. Basically, 25,000 households have a listening meter, literally a piece of hardware, on a coffee table or somewhere near the television. And whenever mom, dad, or the child is sitting and watching TV, they have to hit a button that says, I'm mom, or I'm dad, or I'm child one, child two. And then that device listens to what's in the room, flows that data back up to Nielsen. Nielsen processes the data, and the next day, it produces a market share report that says, OK, channel one, this was your market share. Channel two, this was your market share. You can now go to the advertisers and collect your money. Um, it's a third party audit, and it's very old school. The devices, the uh, the data, the, uh, the way it's processed is very arcane. Um, imagine when, instead of 25,000 households through this arcane device, 25 million households are able to flow much richer second-by-second real-time data into the industry, what kinds of decisioning we can have at that point. Um, so you know, that's basically the, um, the, the business model that we wanted to put ourselves into, which is to aggregate that data and then enable businesses that leverage that, that data. Thank you. Hi, Dominic. Uh, would it be legal right now in the States to produce and sell a, basically a USB device that connects to a TV and has a BitTorrent client 
on it, and an interface that allows you to basically uh, watch on demand. So what's the question? So would it be legal in the States to produce a device, a USB uh, device, so that basically connects to a TV and it has a BitTorrent client? So the, um, the fact is you could probably build a, a, a sound legal argument to make that device. Um, because you know, we made the software, and we distributed the software now for you know, uh, 13 years, uh, and 10 years as a commercial entity. The company has 150 employees. It's headquartered in San Francisco. Um, you know, has a substantial amount of money in the bank and hasn't been sued. Um, the question is: Is the manufacturer of that device willing to take the risk that that we took as a company to you know basically go to sleep every night not knowing whether you're going to legal get a legal letter the next day? Um, manufacturing hardware is capital intensive. There's a lot of risk that goes into making the device, getting it to market, and then you know when you've invested that much. You know, to have that uncertainty, usually it takes a, basically a well-placed individual to make that who's got the money to manufacture it without concern for what the legal ramifications are. Most of the professional VCs and you know, other investors were probably run for the hills if you told them that was your business plan. Uh, that, was, that was my experience. It, and by the way, I, I, it's not that BitTorrent didn't consider making hardware. We actually did build a box, uh, and we went and showed it to our board of directors, and they freaked out. Uh, adding to that, uh, Boris from Filmmaster, uh, we met yesterday. Um, uh, my friend, actually, uh, from Torin, from Poland, created a startup called Streamzo. Not sure if you've heard about it. Uh, it's, uh, they, pr they download all the BitTorrent uh, files on, in the cloud using Amazon, and they uh, stream it to, you can stream it from any device, basically. And they produce a Roku app, uh, and obviously it is available in the States, and it has uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of users already. It's a very new thing from last, from beginning of, last, of this year. So actually, I think it is also already possible in the state. I'm not sure if it's legal for the person to do it, because I think downloading, if you don't have the rights, obviously it's not legal in the States. It is legal in Poland. So you can use the app legally in Poland or Russia, for example, but probably not in the States. I mean, this, this architecture is, uh, is very viable. You know, um, as we know, there's a number of peer-to-peer -peer clients that you can run on your PC, and then you're basically just using the TV as a playback. So in this case, um, the Roku device is doing your, your media playback, streaming from a local machine in the network, right? Yep. Um, very viable. In fact, the TVs themselves are, are increasingly shipping with that capability. If you don't have a Roku device, you have a Samsung TV, there's probably a way to do that with your it's, Samsung It's actually TV. HTML5 uh, videos, so it's, it, might be even, it might even work in some smart TV browsers. Well, okay, so that's a good point. Um, where a lot of those experiences were breaking is that uh, the TV playback device may not support the codec that your, your yeah. downloaded media was uh, you know, delivered in. Um, but you know, I think the, the Torn ecosystem is, in my experience, um, pretty responsive to consumer needs, and you know, there's probably entire Torrent organizations that are encoding for iPads right now. Uh, you know, maybe they're membership only right now, but those encodes are flowing, you know, into the public Torrent sites as well. Yeah, they actually do this as well. They encode specifically for every device. Uh, so for, for iPad, they encode in the iPad-friendly model, and for Roku, for Roku and stuff like that. So I think, and there's a couple of startups like that already. So yeah, that's super cool. <laughs> Actually, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, here you go. Hello. Uh, my name is Peter, and I, I don't have a TV set since, I believe it, it, it's 15 years past when, for the last time I had a TV set. Um, and the reason why I, I'm not, I wasn't, I'm not using it is just because it's not like a la carte, actually, you, you, the, the selection of the of the shows was so limited that days. Um, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm a heavy user of Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime, both illegal in Poland. Um, but um, uh, why I'm, w my question actually is, um, you think that, that the possibility, well, technical, techni technical possibilities are available for a um, television a la carte, so you technically can I uh, can um, make your own lineup for the TV programs, shows, and so on. And I know that that means that you, you don't need the broadcasters uh, itself anymore if, if something like that happened. 
I, I know that, that in South Korea, that thing's happening actually, at least uh, part, partially. So uh, do you think it's it, that, that business model, that, that kind of ex uh, TV experience uh, is going to happen in any not that distant future? So um, it's a great question. So the question is, is there an a la carte business for television, given that people are spending in the US 80 bucks a month for cable and they aren't using anywhere close to that much content? So can we build a bundle that's exactly what you care about for a lot much less than 80 bucks? A very, very logical question and very logical that someone should build that service. Uh, I'll, you want some inside baseball, uh, and I'll tell you why companies like Netflix, Amazon, Intel was, had put two or $300 million into building a service to do exactly that. Uh, it never launched, and I'll tell you why. Um, today, the cable subscription uh, generates, like I showed you earlier, you know, somewhere around $60 billion just in the US market alone for companies like Disney, Viacom, Discovery, all the cable programmers who put their content into that all-you-can-eat subscription. The way that those business deals are made is that the channel provider, let's say ESPN, gets a certain amount of the monthly bill every month whether you watch ESPN or not. Um, so then the question is, well, let's suppose ESPN is getting $5 out of the 60, which is pretty close to reality. If you're a sports fan, wouldn't you love to be able to just take $5 a month for ESPN and just forget all the rest of the stuff? Yeah, there's a lot of ESPN people who would love to do that. The problem is that ESPN is owned by Disney. And Disney also makes money from the Disney Channel, from ABC, and from these other things. And so when Disney makes a deal with uh, Amazon or Intel or Netflix, it says, you can't pick and choose what you want. You have to take the whole thing. Uh, and you have to put it into your, if you have the equivalent of a basic cable subscription, you have to put it into your basic cable subscription uh, so that regardless of whether the, the guy paying for it is a sports fan or a, a, you know, a children's movie household, they're paying for all of it. And so where the internet guys fell over is when we went in and said, hey, we want to build these packages and bundles specifically for different audiences, uh, the, the guys who are making all the money today from those shows were uninterested you know, to, to unbundle their, their programs. Um, their argument is that we wouldn't have shows like Game of Thrones if it wasn't for this very, very massive amount of money that's being coming out of households every month, whether you watch those shows or not. The production qualities wouldn't be as good as we want them to be if they didn't have that kind of uh, that revenue potential. That's, that's the inside baseball. Uh, we have time for one more question. So go I ahead. wanted to go back to BitTorrent. And have you guys been working on any D DRM solutions? So like you can do peer-to-peer -peer distribution with DRM, so it could be you know wider adoption for. Um, I I uh, built a prototype product of um, you know when we were sort of running around with the studios and the mu music labels and saying hey you know BitTorrent's not a crime. You know, these are all the things we're doing for the industry and blah, 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 blah. Uh, we actually said, like, hey, let's work together. You know, there's got to be ways that we can help each other out. We've got 160 million people using our software, downloading your shit. Uh, why don't we give them an option to get it legally? And uh, we did get quite a few companies to agree to do that. That's how we managed to stay out of court. Um, I did build a product that would allow you to download a movie, get, like, five minutes of it for free, and then decide at that point whether you wanted to pay for the rest of it. Um, I was having a lot of challenges getting the studios to allow me to ship it. Um, DRM in general is a, you know, kind of, uh, it's offensive in a lot of ways in the way it's being used today, uh, in the way that we're sort of handicapping the media that we're offering to the consumer. Uh, it makes the experience generally worse than the physical alternative, and so we were having a hard time. When DRM is totally invisible to the consumer, you know, that's, that's probably okay. Uh, it, in most cases, it wasn't. It was DRM that was in, fl in play for most of the time I was at BitTorrent was offered by a company like Microsoft and very closely tied that to the operating system so that you couldn't take a Microsoft DRM package and consume it on an Apple device. Apple, it, in the early days, was doing exactly the same thing. Anything you bought on the iTunes Music Store, you wouldn't be able to take off and consume on a Windows Media Player. Um, were we interested in building a new flavor of DRM? Not really. Uh, would we have done it if it, you know, sort of got us a, an interesting business model? Probably, but um, 
the amount of time that the studios take to approve a new flavor of DRM that you can use to encode their content is years. I mean, like they, they make it very difficult for you to innovate at that sort of the security layer of, uh, of content delivery. It's actually a, a soul sucking experience, actually. <laughs> yeah, sorry, guys, no more time for questions because, so first of all, please give me a round of applause. That was awesome. <laughs>